This is a daily occurrence on the streets of Washington, D.C. Plain-clothed and uniformed police swoop down on people suspected of selling drugs. Uh, you sell syringes and needles? You sell all clean new ones? Yes, sir. You're concerned about it's nothing new. Washington police have battled open-air drug markets for the last few years. But now there is a new sense of urgency because people are being killed in record numbers. Officials say drug dealers from New York City and elsewhere have come to Washington to carve out a share of the city's drug trade. Washington's mayor, Marion Barry. The New York contingency is heavily armed, unlike before where you had local people involved. And according to the police, the local drug dealers and drug sellers themselves have to become heavily armed. And I would say 80% of the murders we've had here have been drug users and drug dealers killing each other. They're just mean, and therefore life has no value, apparently. This has been a violent day in our area as police in Prince George's County wrestle with a troubling multiple murder. Five people were discovered shot to death late last night in Landover, and once again it's believed drugs are behind it all. People have been killed in apparent battles between drug dealers, like the executions in January of five people in a Washington suburb, and for robbing drug dealers of drugs or money. Police say that's what the 23-year-old driver of this car did. He was machine gunned to death by a group of men as he sat at a stoplight in Washington in the middle of the day. The young man's mother was interviewed by a Washington television reporter. I say to all the young black youths today to please leave the drugs up. No, I don't want any mother going through what I'm going through. That was my first boy. He didn't even live to see his 24th birthday. <laughs> Something has got to be done. The city's drug-related murders have included children as young as 12. Children often have been used as drug couriers. Not only are Washington's drug dealers apparently more ready to kill, police say they use the most sophisticated weapons. This machine gun, test fired for us by Washington police, was confiscated from drug suspects. So were these weapons. D.C. police have captured a record number of guns, close to 600 since January 1st. It's serious, dead serious. It's dangerous business out here. And uh, those who try to tell on other people have to be very, very careful because these guys will kill you. It's a multi-million dollar business in Washington. It's that kind of money that drives the drug wars. These are the drugs that make the millions Washington drug dealers are fighting over. The powerful hallucinogen PCP, a liquid often sold to dealers in innocent looking bottles. They sprinkle it on marijuana and sell it. Crack, the cocaine derivative that's fast replacing PCP as the most popular drug on the Washington street market. The Washington market is particularly profitable and attractive to out-of-town dealers because drugs in Washington are in short supply and demand is great. D.C. Police Inspector Nelson Grillo oversees the Narcotics Division. We don't have a, a, a large supply of drugs here. That's coming in from other regions, and particularly in the case of crack, whereas we understand crack would sell for $5 a vial on a street corner in New York City. Certainly they can, they can realize a New York dealer who travels down here just for the day, and that does occur, could sell that for $20, $25. So just for the profit motive involved in it, it's worth the, a trip. So in effect, the success of the Washington police at controlling the supply of drugs keeps prices high and draws in profit-seeking dealers. Officials acknowledge that the drug markets that flourish in Washington's poor communities are supported by middle class and working people who buy the drugs. In fact, a recent report by the Rand Corporation says the Washington area, one of the most affluent in the country, also has one of the nation's highest rates of consumption of illegal drugs. These young people are former drug dealers and users. They are now in a Washington-based drug rehabilitation program. They testify to the lucrative nature of the Washington drug trade. Program counselors did not want us to identify this young man who sold drugs in Northeast Washington. Tell me about how the drug operation you were involved with worked. 
Mainly, we worked out down at the 7-Eleven and McDonald's store, and people people would drive through, and we we served them in the cars. It would be about 15 guys out there. All of them got cane, love boat, reefer, anything. We stay around there mostly about 24 hours a day and make money. How much money? We might put in about 5000 a day. This is a lot of money to be made. The shooting war over the valuable street drug markets is concentrated across the Anacostia River from Capitol Hill in the city's poor black neighborhoods. The city is 70% black, and so are the vast majority of those arrested for drugs and killed in the drug war. Drug violence has left these neighborhoods in turmoil. These children live within blocks of the sites of several drug killings. You know, it ain't any safe around here no more, man, like it used to be. Can't even sleep in your house. Like day day. Somebody <laughs> shooting outside day day. or selling drugs in front of your house or something like that. Bonnie Johnson is a community organizer in another low-income neighborhood in southwest Washington. What goes on here? Um, this is 203 Inn Street. This is public housing property, and this is the alleyway that leads into the apartment building. At noontime, there's a lot of drug dealers here. They're usually out here with their friends waiting for people to come and make a deal, buy some drugs. Good morning. Um, as you can see above, there's two holes where people usually throw their drugs up in those holes when the police comes. Now, the police usually are sitting here in the evening for, I guess, five to ten minutes just to keep the traffic, uh, drug traffic away. But other than that, uh, when they leave, as soon as they leave and get out of sight, the drug dealers are back here. Deester Greer has lived in the apartment building since 1984. What's it been like? Hell. It's been just like hell. I mean, they bust the lights out. They push you down. It's so dark you can't see coming in the building or going out the building. And you can't say nothing to none of them. Seen a few people laying out here dead. You hear the shots and stuff. Despite the fear and violence, many in Washington's low income neighborhoods find it hard to say no to drugs. Drug money fuels the economies of poor neighborhoods and supports many of those not involved in the drug trade. In some instances, uh, I've heard that. Uh, drug dealers are offering tenants a certain amount of money, maybe two or three thousand dollars, to deal drugs out of their apartment. The drug environment in Washington reaches down to the youngest children. Alberta Munlin runs a community center that overlooks one of the city's most notorious street drug markets. She holds tutoring sessions for neighborhood children to keep them away from the open drug trade. The kids come to school so disillusioned, so unwilling to work because either their parent has been arrested or somebody's overdosed with drugs or something has happened to that child that they can't educate him. Washington City Council member John Ray says the drug crisis won't change until the realities of urban poverty do. If you are a 12-year-old black kid, you know, living in southeast Washington, D.C., and you look at the opportunities, you know, the opportunity of holding a good job, owning a home, uh, educating your kids, uh, finding a job that just, that even plays health care. I mean, the future is not very bright for you. So to them, selling drug is a logical choice. It's a logical choice. And we've got to do something that will make that youngster realize that selling drug is not a logical choice. And you're not going to do that if every day when that child wakes up, he's faced with the surroundings of the ghetto. It's not going to happen. Reason I'm stopping you have a roadblock here. Yeah, I see there's something hey. here. Hey, here from it. I appreciate y'all being out here. Make me want to leave to drive at night. City officials admit the problems of the drug trade won't end soon. They say they're doing all they can to reduce the drug trade's effects, from spot checks of drivers and vehicles near drug markets 
to a plan to issue police 9mm handguns that hold more bullets than conventional police sidearms. But Mayor Barry says Washington can't win the drug war on its own. The federal government does, in fact, have the military might, the economic might, and the diplomatic might to stop it. They just won't stop it. They can stop Colombia from becoming the largest cocaine-producing country in the world. They can stop that. And Peru, they can stop Mexico from being a, uh, a way station. The message of this neighborhood art in Washington, D.C. is that drugs lead to death. That fatal prediction was true for the vast majority of the 119 people murdered in Washington in the last 79 days. Sit down and make sure medicine works. Sit. Why you shoot up? City officials say some 80% of the killings were related to drugs. The open and highly profitable trade in crack cocaine and the hallucinogen PCP spawned deadly disagreements in the city almost every night this year. He's a black male. Located 13 the block. Most of the victims were young black men involved in the drug trade. Most of the killings occurred in and around the dozens of drug markets in Washington's poor, predominantly black neighborhoods. What Washington Mayor Marion Barry said a year ago applies to the city's drug war today. And I would say 80% of the murders we've had here have been drug users and drug dealers killing each other. They're just mean, and therefore life has no value, apparently. A familiar scenario, the execution of the young man who drove this car. Reportedly, he stole money from drug dealers. Four men riddled him with bullets while he waited at a traffic light at midday. Several innocent people have been hit by drug dealers' gunfire, but Washington's mainstream bastions and affluent neighborhoods largely have been immune to the violence. Nonetheless, the concentration of news organizations, the federal bureaucracy, and the Congress in Washington has made the city's death toll nationally known. What we want to do is to offer some help at the federal level, to get in, to help, and then to get out so that the District of Columbia can run its own affairs. Last week, drug czar William Bennett chose Washington as the first showcase of the federal government's anti-drug effort. At a Senate hearing later in the week, Senator Warren Rudman lambasted the city's leadership for failing to stem the violence and called for a federal takeover of the 3,900-member Washington police force. You can't have people killed and blood running in the streets of the city like it was some third-world capital run by a despot. It's absurd. It's the mayor's fault, obviously. It's lousy leadership. And there are those of us sitting here quietly looking at the situation saying, Enough's enough at some point. Meanwhile, the curfew law passed by the Washington City Council was aimed at protecting children and teenagers from the violence and at getting other young people out of the drug markets. Children often act as drug couriers. Last year, a 12-year-old allegedly working for a drug dealer was murdered. The curfew law was to take effect today over the opposition of Washington Mayor Marion Barry. But a Washington judge suspended the curfew temporarily based on the assertion of the American Civil Liberties Union that the law is unconstitutional. For nearly 18 months, the drug-related death toll in and around Washington has risen steadily. In the city alone, 135 people were murdered since the start of the year. Local officials say 80% of the killings arose from disputes in the city's drug trade. The violence has drawn increasing attention from members of Congress who make Washington their home. At a recent hearing, U.S. senators voiced their impatience with the city's efforts to stem the drug murders. You can't have people killed and blood running in the streets of the city like it was some third world capital run by a despot. Similarly, the Bush administration has focused on the city's drug problem. Last month, drug policy director William Bennett considered a plan to take federal control of the city police department. Today, Bennett announced instead a multi-agency federal task force to buttress the city's efforts against drug-related violence. Here, where the problem is so glaring, so out of control, serious questions of local politics and governance can no longer be avoided or excused. They must be answered. We've determined that, consistent with the federal government's special relationship to the district, the need and the means exist for significant federal emergency assistance to the people of this city and this region. Today, we are announcing a plan for such assistance. Among Bennett's proposals is immediate relief for the city's vastly overcrowded prison system. In the last 18 months, D.C. police arrested 30,000 people on drug charges, the highest per capita arrest rate in the nation. 
The Bennett Plan on Prisons calls for transfer of 250 inmates currently in the Washington jail to federal prisons. The resulting new jail space would be used to house new drug suspects arrested in the city. The plan also commits the Federal Bureau of Prisons to build a new 500-bed prison for the city and a 700-bed federal facility to house prisoners from the Washington-Baltimore region. Housing Secretary Jack Kemp's department is one of the seven federal agencies cooperating in the Bush-Bennett anti-drug plan. I'm asking today uh, D.C. Police Chief and the Public Housing Authority of D.C., along with public housing authorities around the country, to engage in those type of uh, operations that can clear out and secure public housing projects from drug users and abusers and dealers. The housing secretary's part of the anti-drug plan includes elimination of administrative rules to allow speedier evictions of public housing residents suspected of illegal drug activity, posting guards and erecting fences around public housing projects, requiring photo ID cards for entrance into public housing areas. Some of Kemp's initiatives already are in place in public housing developments. In Chicago, access to public housing already requires an ID card. Chicago officials say crime in those neighborhoods has fallen 30 percent. And the suburban Washington city of Alexandria recently received Kemp's permission to eliminate administrative eviction procedures. Housing officials in Alexandria and throughout Virginia now may evict public housing tenants first and defend the eviction in court later. The city of Alexandria's request to speed up the public housing eviction process grew out of this incident last month. A suspected drug dealer shot one Alexandria police officer to death and wounded another in this public housing development. Reportedly, he was trying to collect money from a young cocaine dealer who lived there. The last major component of the federal plan to help Washington, D.C. involves commitment of new federal law enforcement personnel. The Federal Bureau of Investigation will temporarily add 25 agents to its investigative resources of major drug distribution networks and drug-related violent crime in the Washington metropolitan area to provide enhanced technical and forensic advice. That technical advice includes access to the FBI's sophisticated evidence examination laboratory. Help from 57 new investigators, including lawyers and military intelligence experts from the Department of Defense. A review of whether to employ the National Guard in Washington's war on drugs. And identification of drug cases for possible prosecution under the new federal death penalty law. But at today's news conference, drug czar William Bennett warned that ending drug-related crime and violence will take more than enhanced law enforcement. I do not pretend that quick and easy solutions exist for Washington prob Washington's problems, and we offer no quick fix today. Such quick solutions do not exist. It will take time for things to get better here. An entire community, an entire metropolitan area must be mobilized in constructive anger and purpose against drug crime, drug criminals, and those who aid or abet them. I am pleased that this administration is able to help, and I promise to revisit the situation in Washington in six months' time and at six-month intervals. Report to you at that time on those occasions on progress made, problems still unresolved, and promises kept or unkept. 1988 and 89 were the deadliest years on record in Washington. More than 800 murders, well over half related to a thriving trade in crack, heroin, cocaine, and other illegal drugs. Like other large cities, the drug culture had become a way of life for many Washington residents, and officials despaired about the pervasiveness of the problem. In that atmosphere last April, Drug Policy Director William Bennett announced the federal government would intervene to help Washington because city officials were failing on their own. Here, where the problem is so glaring, so out of control, serious questions of local politics and governance can no longer be avoided or excused. Bennett promised technical assistance from the FBI, aid from the military, possible deployment of the National Guard, more and tougher prosecutions of drug offenders. He also promised to move some city prisoners to federal jails and build new prisons for Washington and the surrounding region. But six months later, Bennett complained that the city was dragging its feet, especially on building a new prison. Do we want to see drug dealers 
uh, down the road in a prison, or do we want to see them down the street in the shadows? Uh, and we're going to have to bite this bullet as a country uh, and build these places and accept them. Uh, or the guys are not going to be in prison, uh, they're going to be down the street, uh, down the hall, uh, down the block. Washington officials say finding a place for a new prison has been a delicate political issue for years, and Bennett should not have expected a quick resolution. It was typical of disputes to follow between Washington officials and their new federal partners. City officials say Bennett's staff has been detached, uninvolved in the anti-drug efforts of the city or the community. And for its part, the city has its own image problems because of the much publicized cocaine arrest of Mayor Marion Barry, who was scheduled to go to trial in June. Questions about the mayor upstaged this morning's press conference, where Bennett and Washington drug czar Sterling Tucker were to report on the year-old D.C. initiative. Look, I don't, I don't really uh, comment on the mayor. I don't really think about the mayor. I think about the citizens of Washington uh, and what we can do uh, to improve that, uh, that uh, situation. I'm the principal spokesperson uh, for this problem, so whatever's wrong with this war on drugs is my responsibility. Uh, in the District of Columbia, and I accept full responsibility for it. A seemingly uncomfortable Bennett admitted his much-heralded intervention into the D.C. drug war had shown no significant success. The city of Washington is still in trouble. Helping fix that trouble is not easy. It has not been easy, as I knew and I said last year at this time. Work in some very serious areas on some very serious topics is not as far along as I'd like to see it. Bennett said the most glaring example of that lack of progress is the city's homicide toll, which last night reached 134, a pace that would set a new record. Last year's D.C. murder rate and an apparent continuing trend into this year are a bitter disappointment to all concerned. On the issue of a new prison to ease massive overcrowding, Bennett said the federal government would accept 500 new D.C. prisoners, but his promised new facility was not in sight. We had initially intended to construct and operate a new federal prison at an unidentified, uh, at an identified area site, as then unidentified. As you know, but uh, this project has now entered the American NIMBY, or not in my backyard syndrome, lore, and enough said about that for the moment. But there also were hopeful signs in Bennett's report, and they seem to be reflected in Washington communities like this one, once ravaged by drug-related gun battles. Bustling open-air drug markets once were commonplace here and in other of the city's mostly poor, mostly black neighborhoods. They are no longer in evidence. Though city officials say many of the sellers and buyers simply have moved indoors or to more isolated streets like this one. An apparent increase in police presence here in the city's notorious 7th district may be one reason. While we're out here, we need the visibility of the police force. A few blocks away, the open drug trade also has been harassed by citizens' patrols, made up largely of middle-aged residents. Organizers say their presence eliminated a virtual curbside drug supermarket that flourished on this block two months ago. It's estimated there are more than 6,000 patrol members throughout Washington. Uh, mainly, it's losing. Losing their community, losing their kids, losing their homes. This is what they're afraid of, really. But organizer Foreman says his patrol came about without help from William Bennett's federal forces or from Washington officials. No one from the federal government had approached anybody in any of the Orange Hat coalitions that I know of. Um, we have no input from uh, the federal government, per se, and no input from the district government beside the Metropolitan Police Department. Washington also has seen a sharp decline in the use of the hallucinogen PCP and may be benefiting from the apparent national decline in cocaine use. Buttressing such hopeful signs is a new statistic. Washington, alone among 23 major cities, recently saw an 11% drop in the number of people arrested who tested positive for cocaine. The drug use data accumulated through such programs is thought to be significant for two reasons. Arrestees are a population in which drug use is especially concentrated, and use levels and trends among arrestees tend to anticipate those for the general population. But Washington officials say if the number of cocaine users here is indeed down, the supply and purity of the drug have not diminished. 
and the deadly rivalry among drug dealers continues. For residents of the violence-plagued 7th District, like Bill Easter, comes criticism of the joint federal-city anti-drug effort. A lot more could have been done. I mean, there's been a little too much bickering between the federal government and the local government as far as the, um, you know, the, where the blame goes. You know, they're blaming each other for, uh, I guess, the funds or manpower or not enough this and that. And, you know, it's not good to hear all that bickering, uh, especially when you hear the residents. You know, we're all keyed in on trying to clean up the drugs and the government's fighting and arguing among themselves. And, you know, it's, it's not, not a good morale booster. Others say the Bennett plan missed the mark by failing to add significant drug treatment facilities to cut down Washington's waiting lists of drug users. If we attempt to make an effort in helping them, then maybe they'll look and they'll help themselves. Then, we, then the drug dealers wouldn't be able to get these fancy cars, all this money, you know, because they're living off us. They're living off the people that's on drugs. So one year after the federal government's first targeted domestic anti-drug initiative, the results in Washington are mixed. And pessimists say the improvements may just be temporary swings in the drug cycle, and that the issues of poverty and economics that contribute to the problem remain unaddressed.